So I always like to start out these uh, meetings about what is HACAST. And first of all, the funny acronym that stands for the Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences team, we pronounce it HACAST, kind of like outcast. And this is a four-year initiative that is going on through 2025. But it's really the third generation of an initiative that started back in 2011. The current iteration has 14 members, and each of the members is working with a team of co-investigators, students, and collaborators with the mission of connecting NASA science with air quality and health applications. The activity of our team really falls into three different categories, and I think you'll hear about all of those today. There are member projects, and these are the projects that individuals pr proposed when they joined the team and was the basis of their selection for the team. Then there are what we call tiger teams, and these are collaborative projects that have emerged over the course of the team, specifically to support stakeholder applications. And these are generally 12 to 18 month kind of fast turnaround projects. And finally, I work with Jenny and Alex and uh, the NASA Applied Science Program to support outreach and build engagement and partnerships and support emergency response and kind of new needs as they arise. So I mentioned that this is the third generation of the team. The first generation was called ACAST, which focused on US air quality. For the past um, few years, we've been HACAST, um, focused on both health and air quality. And uh, while in some respects, this activity resembles um, other sorts of applied science programs, the team structure really changes the outcomes. It increases the visibility of work and resources to end users. It builds a culture of support to promote collaboration. Uh, and we can spin up high value activities in part through regular sharing at meetings like this. So our goal is for this, the whole to be greater than the sum of the parts, even though each part individually is pretty impressive. So when we think about NASA data, there are models, there are aircraft flights, there are ground-based instrumentation, but you know the, the gemstones are really the um, constellation of satellites that observe the earth from space, allowing greater coverage of chemicals that we really could never see from the ground and could be used by different organizations in different ways. And what HACAST is, is really a bridge trying to connect billions of dollars of infrastructure from NASA and other agencies around the world with the practical needs of organizations that could use it to advance public health and clean air issues. So our team has 14 members. You'll be meeting all of this, these team members today over the course of our meeting. Um, they span uh, government labs and universities from Alaska to Florida and almost everywhere in between. I mentioned these three, two types of projects, the individual projects and the tiger teams. We're really in the middle of the first year of the Tiger Team collaborations, and many of the sessions in today's meeting are focused around presenting the work of these Tiger Teams. Um, you'll also be hearing about the individual projects, and really there's a kind of a ebb and flow between individual and Tiger Team projects because HACAST funded researchers are often participating in Tiger Teams that fit naturally with what they're already doing. Um, and so support some of their existing partnerships. The meetings like today are really an important part of our activity because we really wanna hear from stakeholders. We have many stakeholders speaking on the panels of our meeting, and we also wanna invite your engagement through the question and answer and discussion, both in the chat and um, through back and forth. We have uh, online coffee time, and we really hope that you'll take advantage of these to share your thoughts because we take the comments and input from our stakeholders and from these meetings very, very seriously. We hope you'll join us in person in June when we'll be in Houston, we hope, and then in Madison, Wisconsin in October. Um, some examples of highlights that have come out of this team, one that just came out yesterday, published in Nature, uh, was a study by Randall Martin's group um, presenting uh, a global analysis of changes in nitrogen dioxide uh, during the COVID-19 lockdowns. Um, work over the past few years by multiple people on our team in um, the journal Environmental Manager, the magazine published by the Air and Waste Management Association, 
highlighting different ways that satellites can be used for national ambient air quality standards, introductory information, how it can be used for health and the benefits of the neutrope OMI instrument. Um, another highlight has been the uh, use of satellite data for environmental justice, which is a growing initiative through the NASA Applied Sciences Program. Uh, in fact, they've just launched a new group focused on environmental justice, and uh, John will be talking more about that. But one of the Earth, one of the um, NASA images of the day from November came from work um, out of our team with co-authors Susan Annenberg and Randall Martin and Pat, Pat Kinney, who was part of the previous generation of HayCast. And Kelly Crawford, who was quoted in that piece, is going to be speaking in our panel to, in one of our panels um, in this meeting. Another example of the kind of cool work that's been coming out of our team um, has been looking at the impact of emissions over ports. And this is a big focus of um, Ted Russell at Georgia Tech, his individual project, and also the Tiger team led by Dan Goldberg and uh, who's in Susan Annenberg's group. And they've been looking at um, NOx emissions in different contexts. Here's um, satellite evidence showing that while NOx emissions were going down over land areas during the lockdowns, that's the blue, you can see air pollution offshore going up due to the, due to the ships that were circling in the harbor. Yang Lu's group at Emory University has been supporting analysis of wildfires for health and developing metrics that were reported in the Lancet Countdown's policy brief. And uh, my group at Wisconsin has been building on Brian Duncan's work with EPA. For many years now, um, the EPA has included satellite data in its annual air trends report as shown on the left, and they cite for that a um, website uh, that Brian maintains with Haycast funding. Um, and uh, this has really paved the way for other organizations to look at trends, um, like work that we provided to the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, um, which was included in their, their state air trends report earlier this year. Um, we have these five tiger teams that have been launched this year. And I'll give you a whirlwind tour. You can then uh, use this to help zoom in on which sessions you decide to attend during today's meeting and tomorrow. Um, one is focused on satellite data for environmental justice, um, led by Susan Annenberg and Chin Zhao. One is focused on enabling stakeholder access to data products, led by Kevin Cromar at NYU, trying to build a one-stop shop for data products. Um, one led by Dan Goldberg is um, looking at satellite-based NOx emissions over urban areas and trying to see what would really help decision-making. Uh, another led by Pawan Gupta is integrating um, high-frequency satellite data into the AirNow public outreach system. And finally, uh, a project looking at the health impacts of agricultural burning led by Cheryl Magsiman and Amber Soya. So a wide range of different applications that really showcase and, and advance, I think, exciting areas where satellite data can support health and air quality. So here we are at our update 2022 uh, meeting. And I just wanted to give you an overview of how we're running the meeting. Um, after I speak, uh, John Haynes will be giving the kind of view from NASA on what and trends are going on now and what's coming. And then we'll having, have a virtual networking session uh, moderated by Brian Duncan at 1015. Um, then we get into our regular sessions where we have two parallel sessions. Every session will be recorded. So you can go back and listen to the one that you uh, missed if you wanna hear both in the same session. Um, at 1045, they'll be talking about environmental justice for webinar A and wildfires in webinar B. Uh, at two o'clock, we'll talk about climate change and links with air quality and health, uh, as well as health disparities from rural agricultural burning and, and urban PM. Uh, later this afternoon, we'll have satellite-based NOx and urban issues, along with disasters and applications of satellite data. And finally, at 5.15 to 6.15, we'll have a series of flash talks. And this is another good time to bring a beverage, relax, engage. Uh, it, may be, it may not be coffee in the afternoon, but we'll leave that up to uh, the attendee. And then tomorrow morning, we're starting a little earlier at 8.30, 
Central Standard Time. So I apologize to those of you in California that this is 6.30, um, but we'll have another um, coffee session uh, if we can make sure to uh, fix the Zoom bombing uh, problem. And uh, then we have a uh, session linking, looking at the links between COVID and air quality. Uh, there's been a lot of natural experiments going on uh, and thinking about public communication. Uh, then uh, another coffee break, local air pollution, and uh, growing access to the app data for applications. Um, so that's really our session, which goes all day today and tomorrow morning. And you know, I hope that you'll engage in the meeting, uh, but we have a lot of ways that HeyCast can support stakeholder engagement, joining our mailing list, exploring our website, having one-on-one -on -one conversations with, with any of us, but uh, Dr. Jenny Bradford is really there to help uh, match make uh, new users with uh, expertise on our team. We have lots of networking um, and we've really designed all of our panel discussions to have an extended Q&A session. So I hope these will be an opportunity to ask and answer questions, but also maybe to discuss issues that emerge during the panel discussions. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to uh, John Haynes and look forward to an exciting day and a half. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Tracy, uh, for that great setup uh, for our Haycast Update 22. I'm going to now hopefully share my screen successfully. Always the most important part of the virtual meetings. I guess I'm going to ask uh, Tracy or Jenny if somebody can tell me if my slides are up. All right, getting a thumbs up on that, good. Well, again, welcome everybody. I wish we were seeing you right now in Houston at the Texas, at the Texas Medical Sciences Center um, and getting ready for the American Meteorological Society meeting next week. But uh, of course, we, we cannot help uh, the, the variant waves and we, we seem to have hit at a crest right now. So uh, glad we were able to switch to this virtual conference and get to see all of you at least on our screens. And hopefully we will all be meeting back in person, uh, maybe in late May or early June. Um, building off of what Tracy was talking about, I just want to go one level up and give for those of you who are new to HACAST or new to NASA Earth Science, a brief overview of what we do in the Applied Sciences program and how HACAST fits into that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I am John Haynes. I'm the Program Manager of Health and Air Quality Applications at NASA headquarters, part of the Earth Science Division in Washington, DC. And through that role, I also serve as the program manager at headquarters for the HACAST team. Now, as Tracy mentioned, uh, you know, it all really begins several hundred kilometers above our head with NASA's constellation of Earth observing satellites. And one of the biggest pieces of news since the last time we virtually met was we added an addition to that constellation of satellites with the launch of Landsat 9 from Vandenberg Space Force Base on September 27, 2021. Landsat 9, as many of you know, uh, is in cooperation with the United States Geological Survey. And this is the ninth in a series of land use land cover satellites that have been in orbit since the early 1970s, pro producing the longest global continuous record of land use, land change, and how it is uh, dynamically changed over the decades that the world has ever known. So we're glad to continue that partnership with USGS and add that to our constellation of over 20 satellites and sensors that are, are in low Earth orbit, including several on board the continuously crewed International Space Station that are continuously monitoring Earth's weather, climate, and environment for research and applications purposes. This constellation represents the largest civilian Earth observing constellation the world has ever known and is would not have been possible of course without the cooperation of our domestic partners such as USGS and NOAA as well as several international partners including the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency just to name a few. Now every day terabytes literally terabytes of data on the earth system and how it is changing are downloaded to our ground station from this constellation of satellites. And many of these observations are critical for health and air quality applications, such as vegetation density, land temperature, sea surface temperature, aerosols, fires, and other thermal anomalies. And you can see some others here on the slide. Well, the really great news for us and everyone across the globe is all of this data are free and open access available to the globe at earthdata.nasa.gov, not only to be used for basic research, of course, but also to be used for applications for societal benefit. Now in the Applied Sciences Program where I sit, we have a vision of a world where earth science data is, and knowledge routinely guide decisions at all levels of society and people want more. 
that includes a mission of enabling people and organizations to apply insights from earth science to benefit the economy, health, quality of life, and environment. We do this through three lines of business, including innovative and practical applications, capacity building activities, as well as mission planning. And I'll touch a bit on all of these, of course. But the vast majority of our applications work in the health and air quality program comes from competitively, competitively selected peer review grants that we call for once about every 12 to 18 months through our NASA ROSES solicitation process, which is ROSES is the NASA omnibus solicitation vehicle that we use in the Earth Science Division. Partnerships, of course, are core to our mission. Thriving partnerships uh, are the key goal of applied sciences. Our work would not be possible without them. And over the next several years, we plan to expand connections with businesses, foundations, and nonprofit organizations while continuing to build upon our robust partnerships with government agencies. And that's at all levels, from state and local governments to the federal government to international entities as well. So we have currently five program elements in the Applied Scientist program. Of course, the one nearest and dearest to my heart is health and air quality applications, but we also have programs in water resources, ecological forecasting, disaster management, and agriculture. While also doing several capacity building programs, one RSET, which I'll talk about a bit later, our developed student and workforce program, as well as our international development program with USAID known as SERVEER. But really exciting news is that this year, this fiscal year, FY22, we are actually expanding the Applied Sciences Program into three new areas. That includes wildfires, environmental justice, and climate. The wildfires program will be managed by Dr. David Green. Uh, David Green, many of you may know, uh, is currently managing our disaster management program. He will be moving over to wildfires, and it was just announced this morning that Dr. Shana McLean, uh, who has been with NASA Earth Science Division in many different supporting roles for many years, will take over the disaster management program on February 14th. The environmental justice program is spinning up, including we have a ROSES solicitation known as A.49 on the street right now with a due date in March. So please take a look at that solicitation if you're interested in proposing on environmental justice applications to, to NASA. And also a climate resilience applications area is also being stood up, all in response to the FY22 request by the Biden administration in the president's budget. So I'm proud to say we've had a health and air quality program at NASA for now well on 20 years since the start of applied sciences. Why? Number one reason, as we all well know, the potential health effects of climate variability and change, as well as knowing that air pollution is the silent killer. This infographic from the World Health Organization kind of says it all, that every year there's around 7 million excess deaths worldwide due to exposure from both outdoor and household air pollution which leads us to the mission of the Health and Air Quality Applications Program. We support the use of Earth observations and air quality management in public health, particularly regarding infectious and vector-borne diseases. That's a whole nother part of our program that is outside the scope of HACAST, as well as environmental health issues. We also promote the use of Earth observing data and models regarding the implementation of air quality standards, policies, and regulations, issues of toxic and pathogenic exposure and health-related hazards, while also addressing the effects of climate change on public health and air quality to support managers and policymakers in their planning and preparations in the years and decades to come. You can just see a very non-exhaustive list of our major partners at the bottom, both on the international, federal, and state level. We have now over 30 projects in the health and air quality applications portfolio. That is the largest a portfolio has ever been, I'm proud to say. So I certainly can't list all of our partners, but that's just to give you a taste of some of the people that we work with. Of course, as Tracy mentioned, one of the core facets of our program is the Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences team. As Tracy mentioned, now in its third generation with its unique feature being the Tiger teams. I'm proud to say that being now in its third generation, HACAST has been going on for now 10 plus years. That shows the commitment of NASA Earth Science leadership as well as our appropriators in their belief in the value and the novel innovations of HACAST. They have every, every iteration has continue to build on the legacy of the one prior and has continued to expand its reach, but not only domestically, but internationally. Um, so again, looking for more, of course, great things as this third generation of HACAST moves into its second year. 
I did want to mention our training program that HeyCast works very closely with is the Applied Remote Sensing Training uh, Program known as RSET, currently led by Melanie Follett-Cook at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. The RSET training program provides not only online, but in the before times and hopefully in the future times, hands-on courses on how to knowledgeably use Earth observations for various uh, facets of societal benefit, including health and air quality. Um, I encourage you to take a look at their website. They offer many different webinars, uh, not only on health and air quality applications, but on other aspects of the NASA Applied Scientist Program. And those webinars are archived for, for uh, access later on. So please take a look at it. Again, these range all the way from remote sensing training 101, all the way to more advanced training. So you don't have to have prior remote sensing training uh, in order to uh, enjoy and learn from these webinars. As I mentioned, we're very active also in mission engagement, building on the directive coming to us from the National Research Council's 2017 Earth Decadal Survey and the prior ones to that, where we want to be involved at the ground level when missions are first being developed so we can bring applications perspectives to the table early on in the mission planning process to make sure that our partners get the most bang for their buck once these missions get to orbit. And much of that comes to very thriving and strong early adopters programs, which we have set up to help potential users work with proxy data prior to mission launch and also gather their feedback to inform the development of, of, of new earth science products from these new missions. And I'm proud to say that two missions coming up are crucial to the health and air quality community. That includes, first of all, TEMPO, known as tropospheric emissions, monitoring of pollution. TEMPO will be our first air quality satellite by NASA in geostationary orbit, where it will literally monitor air pollution hour by hour across greater North America at a very high resolution, including ozone, nitrogen dioxide, and formaldehyde. Uh, TEMPO will form a worldwide constellation with similar satellites in Korea, looking at East Asia and the European Space Agency Sentinel-4, which will look at Europe and North Africa. So we'll actually be able to see how air pollution is transported across the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, Tempo, the, the instrument is complete and ready to go. It's waiting to be launched in January, 2023. I believe January 7th is our current launch date. And again, many thanks to Aaron Nager, who serves as our lead for the early adopters program for Tempo. I I encourage you to take a look at the website and, and get involved that the early adopters program is open to everybody as it is with our other crucial mission maya multi-angle imager for aerosols maya is a mission uh, led by dave diner and nasa's jet propulsion laboratory in pasadena california and it represents the first time that nasa's partnered with epidemiologists and health organizations on a satellite mission to study human health and improve lives maya will be in low earth orbit but will be targetable looking at mega cities across the planet where health cohort studies are also ongoing, so we can assess linkages between different airborne particulate matter types and adverse health outcomes. We expect Maya to launch no earlier than 2023. The early adopter program for Maya is led by Dr. Abby Nastin of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I again encourage you to take a look at the website and get involved with that early adopter program as well. And with that, I'm going to stop there. Please take a look at our website at appliedsciences.nasa.gov for more information, not only on the entire health and air quality applications portfolio, but the rest of NASA Applied Science as well. And I'm happy to take questions and I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. And, you know, I think, um, one thing that Jenny and I have been doing while listening to John's very compelling talk is also thinking about how to handle our next coffee break where we were going to have the Q&A in the coffee break. And I think what we'll do is just have the, um, have the Q&A, we'll end coffee break uh, here, which is uh, being moderated by Brian Duncan. And anybody who would like to be, to speak, um, just put your name in the chat and you'll be elevated to a panelist to, to talk. But then we have a little bit more security than we did last time, uh, whether anybody can say anything. Could they also maybe use the Q&A box or is that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can use a Q&A box. Um, I just can, didn't know what would be easier for Jenny. Than you can raise your hand. 135 um, people. And there is a question. Um, uh, and there's a question, John, in the Q&A, which I'll pose to you, is factory location and e-waste e landfill location based air quality data part of the directive? Like, would you view that as part of the mission? 
part, uh, I'm assuming that means part of the directive of HACAST um, mm -hmm. or a health and air quality application in oh, general. Yeah. Like, okay. like I said, using earth observations to look at issues of environmental health and air quality impact on health is certainly a core part of our mission. Uh, we, while I do not know, and Tracy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I do not know of a project that we've had in the past looking directly at e-waste landfill locations and impacts on, health, on air quality. I, I don't recall a project in that realm. Um, and, and maybe I'm not just as versed on it enough to, to know how our Earth observations would, would go with that. But certainly, as I mentioned, we have many satellites that look at issues such as land use, land cover. And we also have a, a really good commercial data partnership uh, where we work with such uh, commercial data providers like Planet Lab to acquire some very high resolution data in areas where our research and applied science um, uh, investigators need it. So sometimes that is useful for looking at more high resolution issues of locating factories, locating uh, you know, landfills and such as that nature. So depending on, on why you're looking at it, I would say it was part of it in the environmental health realm. I just don't know of a project that we've had in, in the past in that. Yeah, and maybe I'll just sort of dovetail on that, which is to say that, you know, really what we're doing is trying to help people use satellite data for new projects and new ways. And there have definitely been published studies that have used um, satellite data to evaluate factory emissions for sure. And um, look like sulfur dioxide emissions, nitrogen oxide emissions are well suited for looking at um, industrial activity and point sources. And so I think that's a good example um, to look to if, if you're interested in that. Um, a question from Jonathan, um, as tempo goes up, would like to know how soon and frequently ground level validation will happen. And, you know, that's a great, the great question, you know, I think um, is if, the, if John, do you, do you have a comment on this or I know you're not on the tempo team per se. Well, yeah, directly. Um, I, I believe that they're planning on, on first light being within three months and some of the first products within six months, but Addy or Aaron um, is on, they, I don't know if maybe better they, I don't know how to, if they could answer it in the Q&A or if they can actually speak. <laughs> oh, there's Barry. Barry has his hand raised. Can we move Barry to a panelist? Barry knows this. He's the program scientist for TIPO at NASA headquarters, so he will know this directly, the answer. Great. So Barry, there you are. That's why we're in coffee break session, yeah, so we, yeah. everybody can join in. Uh, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, if the TEMPO validation team uh, has regular meetings, there's a, a whole host of activities that are planned. Um, the the uh, we've we've over the last few years we've set up a network of ground based sun photometers that are going that will measure the total column of NO2, SO2, formaldehyde, ozone. Um, we have about 50 sites in the U.S. Uh, with these. Uh, they're they're like the Aeronet network except it's for uh, trace gases. Um, in addition, in the summer of, of uh, 2023, um, we are doing a joint field campaign. It's, it's our summer of science under Tempo, but it's joint with NOAA, EPA, and several state agencies and um, regional air quality agencies. So the, uh, the NOAA uh, Chemical Science Laboratory will be flying on the NASA DC-8 in about eight cities in the United States. At the same time, the NASA G-5 will be flying overhead with a Tempo airborne simulator, as well as an aerosol uh, LIDAR and a uh, ozone LIDAR. So we'll get, we'll get uh, the high resolution columns below the aircraft of NO2, SO2, formaldehyde, et cetera, as well as vertical profiles of the particles and the ozone. Uh, while the, the DC-8 is doing uh, vertical profiling and missed approaches in, uh, in the same urban region. As well, NSF will have a C-130 campaign over New York City um, called Gotham. The, uh, the NOAA project is called Aroma. Um, and EPA will have, um, NASA will also have the tropospheric ozone LIDAR, so several ground-based ozone LIDARs in, in the New York City area. 
Uh, we'll launch Ozone Song. So yeah, it's going to be, we'll have instruments on ships. It's, it's a really exciting uh, initial validation effort, but that is just the start of the validation. Uh, it, the validation is an ongoing process. As you all know, the satellite products get better over time. Uh, we're also, um, so we hope to have uh, by the summer of 2023, the products going live. Um, the, the initial few months after launch, we'll be doing a lot of testing of the instrument. And then uh, I should say that Aaron Nager has set up some synthetic tempo data on the um, tempo data archive at the uh, at the DAC. And, and Aaron, do you have a chance to talk about that later in Haycast, I imagine? Anyway, we can put the links in the chat to um, to go look at. So the tempo data format is not going to change. We've we've figured it out. And then I get a lot of questions about about near real time tempo data. We recognize you no know, when tempo was funded ten years ago. We we didn't think uh, far enough ahead that there would be a need for near real time products. So we're we have identified funding for that. As soon as the budget gets passed, we should be able to push that funding out the door. But it, the near real time products may not be available right at launch. It might take us a little more time to get those uh, to the public. And I apologize, we've we've been delayed in starting the near real time products. Uh, um, actually, uh, thank you so much, Barry. And you know, I think this might be a good time to take another uh, question that Barry, you may also be the answer of around Sarah from Sarah Johnson in New York. As she said. Uh, uh, related to John's presentation on the Maya instrument, that New York City was not part of the data collection for Maya and love to know how they can become part of the early adopters to compare with local monitoring and network data. Yeah, so Maya is a, is a really, it's a pathfinder instrument. Um, the, uh, it's very frustrating that Maya will not be able to look at every city in the world. Uh, part of it is, when it was initially proposed, we had two cameras um, that would look at different angles. And uh, as the early on in the project, we realized uh, that we were going to have to descope to one camera. And so as it's flying, you saw in John's graphic that it's it's staring at the city. And then as it flies overhead, it looks back. And so we that's how we get the multi angles. But there's if if it's looking at, um, for example, Houston is not on the list. And uh, at the time Maya was selected, I was living in Houston. I was really excited to get Houston on the list. And when I talked to Dave Diner, he said, well, we, we want to look at Mexico City. And so while we're over Houston, we're actually looking at Mexico City. And so if you're in the same uh, similar uh, latitude, um, you're going to, or longitude, you're going to have a hard time. Um, anyway, the, the budget for Tempo, I mean, for Maya and the, uh, the data downstream limitations and the fact that it's a single camera looking at multiple angles means that we're uh, we're limited in it's it's going to be difficult to add new cities well i should say there's primary right. city and secondary cities and abby has her hand up yeah so abby, abby has her hand up being as i said abby's our deputy program applications lead for maya at jpl and, and lead of course the early adopters program so so abby maybe you want to speak to why boston as Zhang Lu's put out, boston is a primary target area and uh, the field of view there for Boston does reach some of the far eastern suburbs of New York City, but like on eastern Long Island, but certainly not all of Long Island. But Eddie, take a look. Yeah, actually, I, I'm pleased to report that we have recently decided to expand the size of our target bounding boxes. Um, we decided that we would be able to support that uh, with you know, because Maya has a two axis gimbal, so not only are we swinging it in the along track direction to get the multiple angular views, but we have an across track gimbal that allows us to point off to each side. Um, so this allows us more flexibility in terms of targeting um, on any particular orbit. So, and I'm sure Yang has, has more to say about this because he has a project um, in, in New York, but basically I'm happy to report that New York City is now covered in the Boston target area. Um, so, you know, if you are interested in Maya data in New York City, please get in touch. I'll be happy to add you to the early adopters program. And, um, and Yang, please feel free to, to add on to that with the activities that you're doing in New York right now. 
Yeah, uh, Abby is correct. Uh, we have adjusted the PTA coverage area uh, to expand it. Um, so now um, I think at least at least level four fully gap filled data covers entire uh, New York City metropolitan and, and probably Long Island as well. Yeah, and uh, we are in the process of generating Maya like um, level four products for early adopters. I know I know Sarah is. Uh, I mean, I visited. Uh, New York City Department of Health to uh, kind of give a presentation on that. And uh, we are in the process of processing the Maya like product uh, for a full year for the New York City uh, area. That was great news. See, we break breaking news at our HeyCast meetings because uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. So that's awesome news. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. Sure. Yeah, this is this is great. And I, Sarah, I really like how you went from a frowny face in the chat to a uh, celebratory comments in the chat. That's what we love, that kind of uh, uh, whirlwind of emotions we like at the HeyCast uh, meetings. Um, moving to a little bit of a different topic, John, um, Alberto Alaya from Sacramento Air Quality Management District, which first of all, I'm jealous that you guys have the um, URL airquality.org. That's very nice, um, but is new to HACAS. So welcome, Alberto, and interested in the work around environmental justice, which one of our um, sessions right after this is going to be talking about that. But curious from the NASA program perspective, how do you anticipate John reaching out to and engaging impacted communities. And you know, his work suggests that communities like residents and workers need support for capacity building and taking action. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, as we were, uh, you know, I, I like to say, and, and well, I like to say, cause it's the truth that HACAS was really the pathfinder for a lot of our environmental justice work in NASA Earth Science Division with the launch of our environmental justice tiger team back in summer. 2021, but obviously noting from our leadership and from the administration and from Congress, the you know, importance of this issue and how, why we needed more investment in it. Uh, that's when NASA decided uh, after direction from the Biden administration to launch this new environmental justice focus area of applied sciences that's being stood up right now. Um, and, and as you said, you know, we have always at NASA Applied Sciences, one of our kind of number one directives is we do not build it, we do not subscribe to a build it and they will come strategy because uh, it doesn't work. Uh, we, you know, you can't sit there and say, I come up with a really cool widget using satellite data here, community stakeholder, I'm sure you'll love this. And they're like, that's not even what we need, what we want, doesn't even answer the questions or the challenges that we have. That's why we've always said, and we, we stand by that all of our projects, all of our work is hand in glove, hip to hip with partners and stakeholders, state, local, national, internationally, because that's the only way these types of projects work with, with a give and take between the partner and, and our, our uh, remote sensing scientists on what our capabilities are, what their needs and challenges are and where can we work together. So to that end, NASA held an equity and environmental justice virtual workshop in October 2021 to get feedback from the environmental justice community and stakeholders on what an environmental justice applied uh, focus area should look like. And that fed into the development of the solicitation that is currently on the street with due date in March for proposals. And much as the same as all other applied sciences proposals, those proposed uh, proposals Proposals must come in again with partners in the equity and environmental justice community being part of the proposal and, and working directly with the research scientists. Um, now, th that workshop that we held in October is certainly not the only environmental justice workshop we're going to hold. Uh, that's the first in a series, because again, this is a, a give and take a two way street where we're always uh, much like these HACAST meetings giving and, and, and illuminating the community to our capabilities while also listening to the community on their needs to see where we can work together. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, and I'll just sort of uh, chime in from the not NASA perspective is that, you know, one thing I think is really neat about the current solicitation due in March is that it has three different levels of funding, kind of a small, medium and large project. So that if there is more of a scoping type of project with a new partner and kind of sort of building that relationship, that's a good fit for potentially, in my non-official opinion, a smaller project. And so, you know, I think that actually 
I'll just say for stakeholders here interested in environmental justice issues um, that the, the scientists who are working and have access to the data who are interested in these issues may not know you and you may not know them. And so I think one of the goals we're trying to do with HeyCast is being kind of a matchmaker. So if there are organizations, if there's, if there's scientists here who want to get connected with environmental justice in, uh, organizations, please feel free to write to me or to Jenny or, you know, just, uh, send an email. And then if there's um, stakeholder organizations who you think your organization might benefit from satellite data, we're also happy just write to us and we can introduce people. And I think, you know, there's data products that are already available and resources that NASA has already given, including to the environmental justice tiger team that we'll be talking in a few minutes. Um, so that like, we don't have to wait to get a grant from NASA, but just to Alberto's point that often you need funding to move forward, it's great that that funding is, is available. And I know EPA has environmental justice grants. They just announced a round of awardees recently. So I think that this is a growing area of concern and of resources, and um, it's exciting to be the pathfinder. Um, so there was um, uh, a question, John, um, from Ilham in Indonesia, welcome Ilham, about commercial data partnerships. Yeah, just to, um, and I also invite uh, Barry from, from the research side to, to um, bring in his perspective on this. But as I kind of touched on that, and, and Tracy has been a part of this actually in the past. Um, so maybe you should speak to it more than I am. But we've done uh, quite a bit of work in NASA over the past several years to uh, partner with the commercial side of the satellite industry, places like Digital Globe Planet Labs, who through their private satellites have much higher resolution data uh, than what we provide because NASA provides a global environmental data sets uh, that the, the lowest resolution of our data sets or Landsat data sets uh, for land use land cover at about 30 meter resolution. But for some targeted projects, uh, particularly when you're talking about issues maybe of environmental health, sometimes uh, it's useful for research partners and, and our stakeholders to have higher resolution data. Maybe they need to look at the number of houses number of industries, et cetera, and so forth in a certain uh, urban landscape that is uh, too fine of a detail for our environmental satellites to take a look at. So we have partnered with these uh, commercial entities to be able to make these data sets available for research and applications. Um, and, and that data can, can you know, if a researcher is using it, 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 these are funded investigators by NASA uh, for grants that are ongoing. If a researcher is using it, they cannot themselves disseminate that raw data that they're using because that's proprietary, but they can disseminate the results of the commercial data in the projects and how they used it to come up with their um, their results. And a Barry or Tracy, because uh, Tracy was part of one of our commercial pilots actually. Uh, so maybe you would like just to speak to your, your view on that and also Barry. Uh, I'll, Tracy, why don't you go first and I'll. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say, you know, to me, it was really, really educational to be part of this commercial data analysis. And, it, and to be honest, it's it, it was a little mind blowing because some of the things that I thought I knew about satellite data are quite, quite different with this high resolution commercial data. And I think one example is that with NASA data products and other government polar orbiting satellites, you can have data everywhere on a regular interval. Maybe it's once a day, maybe it's once every three days. And for air quality applications, that's what we want because we don't know when air pollution is gonna be high or where exactly it's gonna be high. And we like to have the trends and we like to have the patterns. But the commercial data products are zoomed in on individual locations. And in fact, they're even deployable. So part of the use of commercial data products is you could say, you know, if there was going to be a, a field study in a particular area, you could request data be collected over that particular area at that particular time, which is really neat. Um, but when you're thinking about comparing with a ground monitor, for example, 
uh, you may only have you know, one day of data or a couple of days of data to compare with. And it required kind of a different thinking about how to use the data and also what are the products. And so I was really uh, uh, appreciative of working with the colleagues at Goddard who um, translated the MODIS data into the aerosol optical depth um, algorithm. And they used some of the planet imagery data over a forest fire um, to translate that into kind of a one day AOD uh, product that then we compared with the high split dispersion model, just as an example of very high resolution comparison. But I think this idea of how to use these high resolution deployable instruments is going to become a bigger and bigger issue as we like start using data from new organizations like GHGSAT that looks at methane leaks, but only over deployed areas. It's just, it's just a different way of thinking about satellite data from the sort of like all day whole world coverage that we've kind of gotten used to, that I've gotten used to anyway. I, Tracy did a great job of summarizing what I was gonna say that the, the, the fact that uh, these are pointable, so we, we um, we used them during fire XAQ to look at specific fires that we were going to fly the aircraft and sample the plume and remotely sense the plume. Uh, we are we are talking with GHG Sat uh, about adding their products. We're we're trying to get more sophisticated with our licensing so that if NASA buys the data, it's available to all other government agencies and all other funded scientists at those agencies, including university professors. So. If you have a NASA grant and we have, um, you know, bought the data, then you can also use the bought it for a different project. You can use it for your project, kind of thing. Um, we, we, it is going to be a, this commercial data buy is going to be a larger. We anticipate it'll be larger in the future, so we're looking for new satellites, commercial satellites to buy data from. Um, but this tasking is is kind of like the Maya, not sampling everywhere all the time, but um, you know, the, the carbon mapper program for greenhouse gases is, is, is different because it's a public private partnership, but that, that'll be a similar, um, type of thing where they're, they hope to have many satellites up that, and that can be tasked to look at interesting things that are happening. Um, so yeah, uh, this is sort of the future. NASA isn't going to be doing this all by ourselves. And so we're excited to look for opportunities to partner uh, and provide the science community with um, science and applications communities with high resolution data that we can't get from the NASA fleet. Thanks, Barry. That's that's really helpful. And I think it's going to be an exciting, I mean, sometimes I like to describe that it feels like we're like in the renaissance of satellite data because there's so many new tools and capabilities coming on year after year. It's just a really a exciting time to be to be doing what we're doing. Um, uh, Amber Soya, who's one of our HeyCast members, posed a question about uh, seeing the attendee list. And I'll just say, you know, Amber, as a member of HeyCast, we're happy to share it with you. We aren't going to put everybody's contact information publicly available. We already know that there's um, some uh, nefarious people who somehow uh, got aware of our uh, meetings. Um, but I will say that I think that you raise a great question about maybe making a uh, matchmaking list of some type for people to opt in on and to say what kind of partnerships they might want to develop. And I think that's that. Um, that is something that we definitely could do and would be a nice value added as a way to sort of be building um, a directory uh, of our HeyCast community for those who wanted to opt in. So Brian Duncan on the phone, I'm sorry that, that your uh, moderating of the coffee has been usurped by um, the, the Q&A, but I think that it's been a nice conversation. Brian, oh, you wanna? No problem moderate? at all. I, I, <laughs> Uh, that's perfectly fine. This was a wonderful conversation. I was glad to hear it. Uh, but I think now is time for a break, right? Before we, we start our uh, next session on environmental justice and wildfire smoke, right? Yes, that's right. Okay, so am I done moderating? Yes, <laughs> you did a great job moderating there, Brian. You did Thank excellent. You. Thank you. Really you. Carried <laughs> us through. 
Um, and tra and, Tracy, uh, just a logistics yeah. question for me, for those of us, or for those who would stay um, in the in the environmental justice breakout, which is a CSA, do they need to log off or, do, or can they just stay in this room? I guess that's my question. Jenny, I was wondering the same thing. Can we just stay here if you're staying in yes. environmental justice? Yeah, so um, our next two panels are uh, satellite data for environmental justice. If you're interested in that, stay in this room. It's the same webinar room. Um, I'll probably move some of you guys back to attendees and just have the regular panelists and then I can promote people when we start doing the Q&A. Uh, and then if you wanna go to uh, our other panel at the same time, wildfire, smoke and exceptional events, join webinar room B, which uh, is open now. So I'll just copy that link over. Um, everyone. Great, and thank you, Jenny. But and thank you, John, and thank you, Barry and Abby and Brian and all who participated. Um, I really have, feel like this has kicked us off, and I hope that we continue this um, engagement and, and back and forth and getting to know each other over the next uh, day and a half. So um, good luck to the panels and look forward to seeing folks um, over the course of the next two days. Bye.